Hi everybody, I'm Ian Cunningham from Vector GB. Welcome to this foundation level episode of Engineering the Jigsaw Foundation, episode number seven, how to update ECU software. So in episode F4, what is diagnostics? We mentioned that it's possible to write software to an ECU. In today's episode, we're going to build on the content of that episode and look at how ECU software can be updated and some of the things that may be involved. I'd also like to quickly mention, of course, our guest presenter, Peter Newton, mentioned that reflashing of calibration data is sometimes needed in his episode, F5, What is Calibration? And really, in this episode, we're going to complement the content of episode F6, what is AutoZar? And, and why is that? Well, we haven't yet actually talked about how an ECU starts up. We've mentioned, of course, the main ECU software, the basic software, the RTE, the application. But there's another special piece of software that we put into our ECUs, which is actually responsible for booting or, or starting an ECU. And this is called Flash Bootloader or FBL. And it runs every time an ECU starts up or restarts. And 99.9 something percent of the time, the, the Flash Bootloader will check the main software is okay and then jump to it for the ECU to run. But it's only 99.9% .9 something of, of the time. So the flash bootloader sometimes does something else and it is involved when we want to update the ECU software. That's the, the bit that makes up the difference between the 0.9 something and the 100%. So the ECU software is stored in what's called non-volatile memory or NVM. And this just means, it's a lot of complicated words, just means that the contents are not lost when the ECU powers down. So it's like permanent storage. It's kind of analogous to a, a hard drive in a, in a PC. You know, if we, if we save a file to the hard drive, it's there next time we start up. NVM, kind of the same. Now, the flash bootloader provides diagnostic services that allow the whole NVM to be erased and also rewritten or sometimes we use this terminology flashed or reflashed. And this is done over a network connection to the ECU within the vehicle. And also the FBL will verify that if it has been writing data to the NVM, that that data has been written or flashed correctly. Now, it's really important to mention that the erase really does mean that all stored data in the ECU, so for example, any configuration data that we might have set. So if we want the driver's door to be unlocked first when we use the remote central locking and we've, and we've made that setting, that configuration setting, that will be lost when we erase the memory. Unless we read that kind of information out first, store it somewhere, do the programming operation, and then put that configuration data back again. If we don't do those kind of before and after tasks, we lose any configuration. And typically, when we're actually erasing the software and rewriting it, the main ECU software can't actually be running while it's being changed. So it needs to hand over control of the ECU to the FBL before the programming process is, is begun. And this means the ECU isn't running in, in its normal way. So typically, we can't be driving a car around while the ECU software is being updated. We'll come to OTA, which may be slightly different in a bit. And often the actual software that allows the manipulation of the NVM itself called memory drivers is not contained by the FBL. It's transferred as part of the reflashing operation. So there's a sequence of steps we have to go through to reflash an ECU. And the FBL really expects that sequence of operations to be performed. And if you don't complete that sequence correctly, you can have a bricked ECU, a useless ECU. So robustness is, is important. And the exact sequence and data formats and, and so on that are to be used are defined by the vehicle manufacturer. And we'll talk uh, in, in a moment about some advanced features. And again, these are all chosen by individual vehicle manufacturers. So the bootloader specification is really set by the manufacturer 
Uh, so if you take a programming tool for one specific vehicle and take it to another one, you at best you just won't be able to do anything. At worst, you could you could cause yourself some serious problems. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the non-volatile memory, when we want to manipulate that, we need the supply voltage for the ECU to be within a, a certain range. And typically that means that the, the flash bootloader will reject programming requests if the voltage is, is not correct. Of course, it will look for other conditions. So we talked about not being able to program while the vehicle's driving around, maybe. So maybe it'll look for the vehicle speed being zero or... Um, the transmission being in, in park or the parking brake being applied, something like this. So there'll be some conditions that have to be met before the, the FBL will allow programming to start. Of course, if it does go wrong, bricking an ECU could mean an unusable vehicle. If we brick the engine controller in a, in a vehicle, clearly that vehicle is not going to go anywhere. It's going to have to be recovered. Someone's going to have to take the, the controller off to replace it and that means that replacing unusable ECUs can be really really expensive. So ensuring the reflash process is robust is really a critical step when developing a new ECU and that's because we might want to reflash ECUs during development as we're refining or maybe even introducing new functions. Once values are determined during calibration activities as, as Peter mentioned in, in his episode or even to fix bugs in vehicles that have been sold to real customers. So obviously, if, if, we, if we brick ECUs in development, that's bad. But if we brick an ECU in a customer's car, that's, that's just the worst thing possible. So if we think about over-the-air updates, which obviously is, is a new thing in, in automotive, the ability to have remote updates applied to vehicles, because the, re, the, the robustness of the reflash process is really essential then, some ECUs use redundant storage if over-the-air updates are needed. And what this means is that the ECU has at least two possible storage locations for its software, possibly even three locations. And what we do is we program the locations in turn. So if we have a location one and a location two, and we're running on location number one, then we would try to program location two. And if it fails, it doesn't matter because we're still running on location number one. Of course, we can even now, because we're not having to kind of unstop the, the ECU from running because it's in location one, we can even have the ECU running while we're trying to program location number two. Of course, when we've verified that we've programmed location number two um, and it's been programmed correctly, then we say that that is active and then it's location two that will be used the next time the, the ECU starts up. And the next time we want to do reprogramming, we'd reprogram location number one. And all this is ha handled in the background, sometimes even by the microcontroller. So it's well worth mentioning that as well, we often want to minimize the amount of data we're delivering to a vehicle when we're doing over the air because to, to send data over the air costs some money and we may want to do it multiple times during a vehicle lifetime. And therefore, we might actually include the memory drivers in the FBL. Now, of course, this means that the FBL itself will in, uh, occupy more space in its, its part of the, the ECU NVM. So we may kind of double or triple the, the space for the main software and also increase the FBL space. So we can we can rapidly add um, the need for extra memory in, in OTA. But this isn't always the case. Some remote update strategies don't require the FBL to include the memory drivers. Also, some remote update strategies don't require redundant storage. So this is very much a strategic decision and that can very greatly vary how the over-the-air update is being applied in a vehicle. And this is really just the beginning, only the start. There are other things that flash bootloaders can do to either try to increase the speed of the reflashing sequence overall or to try to prevent tampering of ECU software. So to increase the speed, some FBLs will allow pipeline programming, which means they can receive data ex while they're also writing to non-volatile memory. So quite often what would happen is a, a, traditionally a flash bootloader will get data over the network. It will 
store it locally and then once it's received everything it will start writing it and then once it's finished writing that set of data it will ask the programming tool for a bit more bang 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 um, pipeline programming means you've got data coming in at the same time as you're writing verification normally traditionally was done at the very end of, of writing all the software we can do pipeline verification which means we verify data in parallel to receiving data and and or to, to write into the NVM. So we can, again, speed up the process there. If we really want to reduce the process, we may even want to consider delivering compressed data to the Flash bootloader, in which case the Flash bootloader will support live decompression, where it will decompress that compressed data that is received and then write it into the NVM. To protect the process, we may have authentication so we have to authenticate ourselves in some way to prevent an unauthorized software update. Equally, to prevent people snooping or spying on update packages and trying to reverse engineer them and, and work out what's in there. We may want to have encrypted data that we deliver to a flash bootloader. And then the flash bootloader needs to support the live decryption of that data before it writes it into the NVM. And finally, we may even want to have secure boot. And what this means is that we calculate a signature of the main ECU software, and that's stored in a secure location inside the ECU. And every time the ECU restarts, the flash bootloader will recalculate that signature and compare it with the stored value to check if the software has been tampered with in some way. And if it has, it will stop the ECU from operating. So quite advanced features there, not in every bootloader. So as a summary, all ECUs will have their software changed at some point in their lives, whether it is to introduce new functions during development or to fix a bug. And it's flash bootloaders together with reflashing tools that provide the ability to change the ECU software via the networks in vehicles, because we don't want to have to take ECUs out of vehicles to update the software. And for OTA updates, then depending on the strategy for the OTA updates overall, the flash bootloader that's used can be quite different to a traditional bootloader, or it can actually be the same. There's some decisions that can be, be made. And it's it is, of course, possible to make bootloaders more complex and in doing this we can make the reflashing operations faster or more secure or, or of course both or we can even prevent unauthorized software from running on an ECU and all of these things so the sequences the, the needed features these are defined individually by each vehicle manufacturer so it's important that you know the the right sequence before you try to program an ecu because if you get it wrong you can brick your ecu and that means that you really need to test that whole update process to understand how they might become bricks, and then you can maybe look at ways to, to lessen the chances of that happening. So that's really everything we've got time for now. Before we finish, some further information is available. So on our website, you'll find details of Vector's solution for updating ECU software. It really is comprehensive. We have flash bootloaders for all vehicle network technologies with optional advanced functions such as pipeline programming and verification, decompression, authentication, decryption, secure boot, um, support for redundant memory, and, and other OTA features that we haven't had time to mention. Of course, we provide reprogramming software with optional remote programming capability, and we do that to match different bootloaders for different manufacturers. We support over 150 different bootloaders for I think it's over 80 different manufacturers. We then of course have tools for validating the ECU software update process that will minimize the risk of later bricking ECUs during updates. And as always, there are many technical articles as well as product information and how-to videos at the Vector website. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode. As always, if you have any questions, please use our special email address, engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. Also use that email address if you have any 
uh, suggestions for topics for future episodes and of course you're welcome to, to comment where you've you found this video as well. I'm Ian Cunningham from Vector GV. See you again soon. Thank you. Bye.